Hello, I'm Angelo Corsaro, and in this podcast, I really want to address the key concept behind OpenSplice EDS. So, OpenSplice EDS is a ultra low latency, real time, data centric publish subscribe technology. It has been designed so to be fully distributed, highly scalable, and highly available. It is policy driven and allows you to configure all the QoS that really matters when distributing information. It supports dynamic discovery, full time decoupling, it lives within a very rich technology ecosystem, and it complies with open standards. So, we said OpenSplice EDS is a PubSub technology, but what PubSub really is? The best way, perhaps, of describing PubSub is to compare and contrast it with client-server. So, many of you are very familiar with this technology, which has been around since the late 70s, so it would be perhaps a good way of really understanding the values that PubSub can bring to you. So, when you have a client-server system, in order for the client and the server to exchange information, you have to take into account 4W. The first two are the who and the where, also known as space coupling. So in order for a client to invoke a request on a server, he needs to know where the server is and who the server uh, actually is. Then there is the third W, which is the what. For the client and the server to communicate, they need to agree on something, that something can be an interface or a function signature. And that's the structural coupling. And the fourth W is the time coupling, so the when. So in order for the client and the server to communicate, they need to be in the system at the same point in time. If we compare this with PubSub, in PubSub, the only things that matters is the what, the structural coupling. So typically, you have publisher and subscriber. Publisher uh, say that they produce some kind of data. So in this picture, you see that there are publisher producing blue square, red circle, or green oranges. And subscriber interested in any combination of those and that's all that matters. Then is the PubSub technology that takes care of delivering information being produced by a specific publisher to subscribers that are interested in it. Something else that is interesting to point out in the differentiating, comparing, contrasting client server and PubSub are some other aspects. So first of all, PubSub lead to tightly coupled architecture, and this was summarized on the previous slide by you know the 4W of client server. Client-server technologies typically lead to systems that are complex to deploy because typically you have to set up all this point-to-point connection, which is tedious and cumbersome. They are inherently one-to-one. Clearly, you can emulate one-to-many communication, but that can be made out of many one-to-one communication, which is not the most efficient way to do. But more importantly, they are fragile to fault. And let's see what I mean with this. So let's assume that we have a client that invokes a request on a server, which then also invokes a request on another server to serve the client request. If while serving this request, the the second server has a failure, and let's say crashes, this fault propagates to the previous server, which will expose some either exceptional behavior or perhaps will crash as well. And as you see, this fault is propagating like in a domino up to the client which as a result, it also might crash or have some very exceptional behavior. So what you see is that there is an inherent fragility, fault propagate um, in the chain of control, and this can lead to a domino effect that can practically tear down all your system. PubSub are relatively different to that. And uh, to summarize their, their key point, well, they lead to loosely coupled architecture. Why? Because of only one W compared to the full W. They are plug and play. So you just are a publisher, you connect to the system, the system will discover what you publish and deliver the the data that you produce to interested parties. They are inherently many-to-many, so many-to-many communication is managed as a first-class citizen in PubSub technologies, and they are very fault-resilient. So if we have a publisher that crashes, well, no problem, because the system will continue to work. In this case, perhaps the, the, the triangles won't be produced, but that's not a big issue, because as soon as the publisher comes back, the the system will resume as if nothing had happened. Okay, now let's try to understand what is data-centric PubSub, which is one of the many variations of PubSub. So in data-centric PubSub, it is possible to publish and subscribe structured data. So publisher and subscriber produce and consume portions of a distributed relational information model. But by the way, there is no centralized server storing this information. So in this example, we see, for instance, that we have um, a a relational information model which has been partitioned because of the specific of the application, and we have a publisher P1 that uh, publishes A and B, P2 that publishes D, C and J, S1 that subscribes to A and D, and S4 which subscribes to A. 
you see there is data and there are relationships. So that's a very powerful concept. So now P1 produces a new value for A. This is distributed to the interested party. Then it produces a new value of B. And as you can see, there are no interested parties. So in a sense, this value will be stored in the global data space. Then S2 arrives, and S2 is interested in receiving updates of A, B, and J. At this point, um, the middleware will automatically deliver the updates of B and A. So this is already an example of time decoupling. So S2 is receiving data that was produced before the system knew about its interest. Then let's assume that P1 goes away because it disconnects, because it crashes, or because it was connected through a, a mobile ad hoc network. And let's assume also that S3 comes around, who is interested in B, D, and J. So in this case, the middleware will still deliver the last value of B, although the writer of B is gone. And again, there is no centralized server that stores this information. The information lives in the distributed system. Now, if we have P2 that publishes J, this is distributed to the many interested parties, same things for D. Okay, so, but how can we define the details of the information exchange in the system? And DDS provides you the concept of topic. So a topic is the unit of information that you can exchange between a publisher and a subscriber. Um, a topic is a, an association between a type, a name, and a quality of service settings. Types, as you see in this figure, are described by means of structures, and uh, um, they can have keys. Actually, keys can be as many uh, attributes as you want. In this specific example, we have a temperature sensor, which has um, a temperature ID, which is an integer, a temperature, which is a float, and a humidity, which is a float. And the key for this topic type is the temperature ID. Topics can be really thought of as uh, tables, more or less like tables in a database. And rows in these tables are topic instances. And it's no surprise that an instance is identified by a specific value of a key. Then if you focus on a specific row and you think about the value that this row will assume over time, those are called samples. Topics can be manipulated and filtered by using SQL expression. In fact, you can run queries as well as doing content-based subscription by using a subset of SQL 92. Since DDS supports the concept of topic and the concept of key, all of a sudden becomes sort of obvious the fact that you can really model um, relational data or distributed relational information model. So for instance, if we wanted to design a temperature control system in which we had floors and each floor had several different rooms and each room had conditioners and temperature sensor, we could model these as topics and relationship between topics. Well, as you see, relationship are captured by using the uh, typical database foreign key techniques. And uh, once you design the system this way, then at runtime, you will have bit and pieces of your system that produce and consume data, and you will use SQL to navigate the various relationships. If you don't like SQL uh, or relational data model and you prefer object orientation, then you can always start with a relational data model and reconstruct an object-oriented model, which provides you as first-class concept relationship. Um, and you can move from one representation to the other in any direction that you wish. The other advantage of using an object-oriented representation for your information model is that you can decorate this with local operations. Okay, moving next, how can we control the quality of service in our system? So DDS has a very powerful QoS model which is based on a set of QoS policies. For those quality of service that control property that have an end-to-end -end impact, DDS relies on the request versus offered model. So in this case, subscriptions are not only matched because of their type, but they are also matched because of quality of service. And they are matched because of quality of service end-to-end, -end, so that if there is a mismatch with respect to request and offered quality of service, a subscription cannot happen. DDS provides a wide set of quality of service that control data availability, data delivery, data timeliness, resource and configuration. I will have a podcast specifically on quality of service, but what matters for you to know right now is that you can control throughput and data latency by means of quality of service settings and there are four of those that help you. You can control data availability in your application and there are five QoS that allows you to do so and you can control data delivery and there are three QoS that allows to do so.